We have all at some point of time spent 10 excruciating seconds of our life trying to identify the right photos to get through a capture. But have you taken out the time to understand what happens before, during and after a capture has been solved? Yep, that pain in the posterior is actually a part of a much bigger puzzle. In fact, did you know that Google actually takes all that data that you have given them for free by, you know, identifying cars and signals from a bunch of photos in order to give you more accurate directions on Google Maps. We are going to find that out and a lot more in this episode of Elemental where we talk about the smaller things in tech that make a much bigger impact on the real world. You can catch us every Sunday at 1 p.m. And if you love this series, do not forget to subscribe to our channel and hit that bell icon so that you're always notified of our latest videos. So in the 1990s, the most popular search engine wasn't Google, it was Alta Vista and they had a massive spam problem. You know, the one in which you are sent unsolicited messages and emails, that, that one. Anyway, people were trying to mess around with the database of Alta Vista by creating bots that could actually access the database, get some contacts and then send them spam emails. Now, we hear a lot about bots in our life. Right, like it's one of those things that we tend to understand intuitively, but don't really delve deeper to get a better understanding of what they are. So just a quick introduction to bots. They are not physical beings like the things that they sound like, like robots. Robots are physical, but bots are actually just strings of code or scripts or software that can actually perform a certain task. The task can be as simple as just going on a website, downloading some stuff, and then just putting all of that on your computer. But in this story, the bots were actually things that were sending the spammy stuff to people. Now, Alta Vista thought that it was time to put their foot down, and the solution? Add a checkpoint that can tell a human from a bot. So they added a question to a submission form that only a human could answer. The question was to decipher a squiggly string of letters that is easy peasy lemon squeezy to a human, but not to bots because come on, it was the 90s. Computers weren't that advanced. If you correctly deciphered the letters, you could go on with your business doing whatever you were doing. The solution was given by a bunch of computer scientists and they called it CAPTCHA. It stands for Completely Automated Turing Test to tell computers and humans apart. Previously on Elemental. That basically stands for Low Power Double Data Rate Synchronous Dynamic Random Access Memory. Yeah, we definitely need better naming. Anyway, back to our story, CAPTCHA was pretty effective initially, but soon it was realized that it wasn't enough because it turns out humans were the problem. The guys that were trying to beat CAPTCHA found out that they could actually make the bots do everything except pass the test. So they paid humans to take the test. Yeah, awkward. This was still working fine more or less till 2005 because then the malicious people found out a rudimentary way to crack CAPTCHAs with bots. So an enhanced version of CAPTCHA called ReCAPTCHA was launched and this is where the really interesting stuff starts to take place. So a lot of things were happening in 2005. The iPod Shuffle was launched. Himesh Bhai was becoming a phenomenon that we all know and love. But the important thing is that a lot of major tech companies were trying to digitize books. Yes, that's right. And the thing was, the computers back in the day weren't all that powerful or capable enough to actually figure out, let's say, a piece of text that wasn't printed quite right. Or images. When you see an image, you know that that is probably an apple or an orange, but it's difficult for a computer to do so. And reCAPTCHA used this opportunity. When a CAPTCHA was needed, the system would generate one deliberately distorted word that they knew was right, and another word that was from a book that the system wasn't quite sure about. Turns out that the first word was actually the test. 
And the second word was a way to find out the word taken from the book the system wasn't sure about. And then it recorded the responses that people gave, bunched them all up, and then if there was a general consensus that this word is this, it would take it away and use it for the digitization of books. And people like you and I were doing this all for free. And surprise, surprise, Google bought the reCAPTCHA project and used it to feed its own Google Books project. Now, the flaw in this whole thing was quickly discovered and there was this trend in which people would take videos or screenshots of typing in bad words as the second word and then the CAPTCHA would actually accept it. Yeah, the cheap thrills of 2005. But in the hilarity of the moment, bot makers too caught up with this and so reCAPTCHA 2 was launched. This is basically that click on a box thing that you see that reads, I am not a robot. The one that makes you wonder, how is this possibly more clever than typing in something? Well, nobody knows the exact way reCAPTCHA 2 works because duh, fool me once, fool me twice. But there are a few theories out there that talk about how it may work. For instance, it tracks your browsing information, the cookies in your web browser and possibly your mouse activity or your scrolling activity in case you're using a smartphone and then it allots you a score. Now, if you're using incognito mode, the CAPTCHA will be like, oh, time to give some photos to this person, except that your responses are recorded again and then all of those are used by Google to help them with street view and maps. How far can you even go from technology? Now the version 3 of reCAPTCHA has also arrived and it doesn't require you to click on anything because it is doing all of that, you know, web history tracking and, you know, mouse tracking in the background. And the fun fact over here is that the whole process of making a user wait and click on something, spend his time is actually called user friction. Anyway, now you understand the whole story of CAPTCHA and how Google uses your data to help some of its services. How do you feel about it? Let us know in the comments. And a quick reminder that new Elemental videos come out every Sunday at 1 p.m. And recently we have been doing a lot of awesome stuff like tearing apart a pair of headphones so that we can tell you how the drivers work and a lot of other cool stuff as well like just demystifying tech jargon in general. If you love all of that, do not forget to check out the Elemental playlist and for all things tech, log on to Galaxy360.com.